So I'm going to introduce uh, the panel chair, uh, who is Mr. Amur Alag from uh, Canon, uh, Africa and Central and Africa, and uh, he's going to run the panel session. And uh, we'll just get everybody mic'd up. Uh, we're going to ask a series of questions relating to uh, innovation in higher education. So if I could welcome to the stage Honorable, Honorable Justice Yen Aul Lam Tut, the Minister of Higher Education for South Sudan. Please give him a warm welcome. <laughs> the Honorable Bhuti Manamela, the Deputy Minister of Higher Education and Training for South Africa. Okay, South Africa always gets a big cheer, all right. Okay, let's see if Mozambique can match that cheer. Honorable Professor Dr. Leda Florindo, you go. Give, give Mozambique a cheer, come on. <laughs> Apologies from the Minister of Madagascar, but the Director of Assessment, uh, Research, Education, Finance, Rivo Rakatozavi, is representing Madagascar. Please welcome him to the stage. Um, and just as we, uh, Amur, if you take the last chair, and then we'll get you wired up. Uh, Honorable Professor Marira, I hope I can just uh, summarize your comments, if you don't mind me saying a simple phrase. Countries go, grow because of universities. And uh, that's it, really. Okay, so I think that's a, a fair message from what the, the minister had to say. And we just need uh, one more mic up here. So, Amur, I'm going to hand over to you. And if we take this to around about 9.50, and uh, we're in your hands. Thank you very much, your honorables. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, distinguished guests. Welcome to the innovation in higher education and science and technology. We, as millennial in Africa, we constitute 70% of the continent. And we love technology. Technology that affected every aspect of our life. And higher education is not an exception. Lately, higher education institutions and universities are trying to adapt new ways to overcome challenges. One of the ways is the collaboration between university and private sector. And I wish, like, I wish to start a question to Your Excellency, uh, Professor Aman Morwera. Uh, what opportunities do you see for greater university and industry collaboration to increase enrollment and develop skills for future employability? Um, I think the issue is on systems, whereby we are saying our education has to be configured so that it's able to do that. Before education, higher education especially, was seen as an issue whereby people sit with a professor. At the end of the day, the product is a person who is able to speak sophisticated and do nothing. So now, what we say is, we are going to configure the higher and tertiary education system to Education 5.0, whereby we are saying teach, research, community service, innovate and industrialize. As soon as you start saying innovate and industrialize, you are creating an interface with entrepreneurs, you are creating an interface with government, you are creating an interface with government. So by just saying, guys, your mission now is five missions, it's no longer three, of Ivory Tower, we already have created an enabling environment for that to happen. And you'll discover that in Zimbabwe, we then said, after you have done the structures, things must be seen on the ground, and we started by actually doing that doctrine of innovation hubs, and also physically building them, and also physically building industrial parks, so that this ecosystem begins to be realized. So basically, to me, it's about creating the environment that enables that ecosystem to exist. Thank you, Your Excellency. <clears throat> I would like to move uh, to Madagascar, Mr. Rivu Rakuzafi, representative for the Minister of Madagascar. Uh, we have a question. Are you engaging with the industry partners and solution providers to upgrade scientific research in Madagascar, hence to create a coherent link between the public and private sector? 
Oui, merci, euh, monsieur le modérateur, pour, euh, pour me donner la parole. Euh, D'abord, je tiens à remercier euh, le gouvernement de Zimbabwe pour euh, euh, accueillir donc ce, cette forum Innovation Africa 2018. Je tiens à remercier également euh, les euh, organisateurs et je remercie aussi tous les participants qui sont venus pour honorer donc de leur présence à cette manifestation. Eh bien, euh, en effet, euh, pour, pour, euh, pour le cas, par exemple, pour Madagascar, euh, c'est vraiment une opportunité pour l'enseignement supérieur de développer le partenariat entre l'enseignement supérieur et les industries ou les producteurs, les fournisseurs de solutions. C'est si en, en créant ainsi donc un lien euh, fort entre, euh, disons, le, le secteur euh, public et les privés. Euh, là, par exemple, à Madagascar, on a développé donc des partenariats entre l'enseignement supérieur et euh, tout d'abord euh, les euh, collectivités locales, par exemple euh, les régions qui permet par exemple pour euh, l'université d'Antananarivo de faire une convention cadre, une plateforme régionale de la recherche et de l'innovation et de l'emploi qui permet en fait d'intégrer ces euh, euh, partenaires industriels ou ces partenaires dans les euh, dans les euh, euh, l'organisation décentralisée pour permettre aux étudiants d'avoir déjà un aperçu et que euh, ces, euh, ces personnes des industriels puissent euh, donner leurs avis sur lesquels ils attendent de l'enseignement supérieur. Il y a aussi par exemple les partenaires euh, qui sortent un peu dans le cadre local mais qui sortent un peu aussi dans le cadre régional dans le même, dans le même euh, dynamique, par exemple, l'université de Tana s'intègre aussi dans des réseaux, par exemple le réseau RUFORM, réseau régional de renforcement des capacités des universitaires africaines en sciences agronomiques. Donc ça, c'est bien ciblé pour permettre donc aux jeunes qui sortent de leur euh, formation académique d'avoir déjà un pied dans, euh, avec les les industriels qui travaillent dans le domaine. Et par exemple, également, on a par exemple aussi développé donc, euh, des, euh, des partenariats plutôt dans international, par exemple, toujours avec euh, les mêmes universités, sur euh, 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 la coopération donc, avec la faculté des sciences, avec euh, les universités euh, China University of Geosciences in Beijing. Donc ça permet d'avoir déjà une interface entre le monde industriel et euh, le monde universitaire. Donc ça permet déjà de faire cette interface pour permettre qu'il n'y a pas de fracture entre les jeunes diplômés et le monde du travail. Merci. Thank you, sir. This is very interesting that we see collaboration between private sector and public sector for many African countries. I would love to pass to a country that is established like newly. So a question to uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Justice Yin from South Sudan. In the last seven years, what opportunities are there for private sector engagement and partnership in South Sudan, nascent higher education? First of all, uh, before yes or no, let me thank uh, the, uh, the host government uh, government of uh, Zimbabwe and the people of Zimbabwe for uh, allowing us and hosting this uh, international and national uh, uh, events. And also the partners that make it possible for all of us to come together and uh, explore opportunities. Uh, up to the evening, last evening, I thought that I was in a wrong panel because I was in a wrong events and a wrong conference because since it was started, there is nothing to do with the higher education. 
So all about primary and secondary education. But, but uh, I only to realize uh, last evening that it is actually about networking, about engaging partners, about sharing experiences and also selling your challenges and, uh, and, uh, and this morning I believe it proved uh, to me that uh, we are, I'm in a right uh, conference and I'm right as, as South Sudan has come back uh, and a child that was born seven years ago to this world, we feel that we have a, uh, a need to be involved in such a uh, conferences and, and such engagement so that we sell out what we have in terms of the concerning uh, going back to your question opportunities has a country and has a land so Sudan has a lot of uh, opportunities and have uh, have uh, significant resources that need to be utilized and for you to do this you will need to encourage and allow the competition of both private sector and the, uh, and the public uh, uh, sector. They must compete, they must engage themselves so that you, these resources are adequately utilized. And that for the benefit, of, not only for the benefit, uh, benefit of, the, of South Sudan uh, people, also for the worldwide uh, benefit. Uh, so, for us to do this, we must encourage and our, we must enact uh, legislative uh, legislatures. So, we must engage, uh, we must allow the, uh, the legal framework to take part in this process. So that you regulate it, you allow it to, uh, to happen in a manner that uh, all of us uh, all, all of them will, uh, will, will get, uh, uh, each of them will get himself or herself involved in this process with the, uh, with, with the confidence and, uh, and protections. So the other opportunity we are looking at, before that, could I, if I go back to the current engagement, the, uh, we, in 2013 there was international and national a regional investment conference that was held in Juba, uh, I could recall in January. Uh, that brought all uh, conf uh, industries together, and uh, whether private, especially worldwide private sectors. Those came to South Sudan to explore opportunities. When you are talking of resources, you will go back talking, ending up South Sudan, if, if uh, is a land that uh, has a very vast agricultural land, land that rain nine months. So if you are a agriculturalist, you will need to exercise uh, as much as you can. Any more resources? I would uh, say that we have uncounted animal resources in South Sudan. This is another area, also opportunities that if you are engaged on that, fisheries, we have the Nile, so many streams and uh, rivers that supplying the Nile with so many fisheries uh, opportunities in the land. Leave alone the minerals and the curse of the world, which is the oil. Uh, because it has become a conflicting uh, uh, resource for the world. Therefore, it is very vast and is everywhere in, in South Sudan. You will go talking mining, golds, and all this. Uh, it is everywhere in South Sudan. It's only that we need to kick it off. And for us to do that, we need a significant capacity for, uh, to move it uh, forward so that it ends up with the beneficial. And we are very optimistic and committed, despite the fact that we are a young nation that also a child was, that was left unsupported after independence by the international community. But still now we have a good chance to encourage you all to, to, to come and invest in South Sudan. And to, uh, to guarantee that the current peace that is 
uh, that is our uh, our government and the other opposition engaging in. I can see a significant uh, political will in this. Now I would say most of the, the uh, political, uh, the opposition leaders are in Juba now, engaging the implementation uh, process uh, in this. This could allow all of us to, to come comfortably and utilize and imp uh, implement what you can see now, even recently, there was a, 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 a industry, uh, oil, uh, petroleum conference that was done recently in November. The only, only few days ago, it was conducted. That brought a worldwide, regional, and, and national uh, uh, business uh, opportunities to come and uh, to engage in that so that they explore opportunities. So this is, I'm expecting uh, a lot to be done by the private sector in South Sudan as soon as possible. Make, uh, make your exercise, put your house in order, you will have a good opportunity. It is your choice. Education sector is very vast for all of you to invest. We are talking of uh, treasury education, higher education. We have significant opportunities for us. We are engaging at the moment because uh, our priorities now is to engage the, uh, the, the concerned governments to help us with the scholarship. And Zimbabwe was hitting these countries. We have significant number of students in South Sudan are here now. We have significant um, uh, number of students uh, worldwide. This is a uh, number one. Before moving to actual infrastructures of the higher education uh, establishment, when you talk about infrastructures, we are talking of laboratories, we are talking of uh, all the infrastructures that can allow the innovation and science-based uh, uh, studies to move forward, which at the moment most is lacking in South Sudan. It is another vast area for you if you wish to, uh, to, to, to invest. I was uh, proud of the significant uh, com uh, companies that met us uh, last night and uh, last evening. Uh, the, uh, by some of, most of them, I, we, we are very promised to hold them and to have them in South Sudan. And all of you, if you could. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. <clears throat> Lately, we started to hear uh, some of the challenges in South Africa. So the question is to Your Excellency, Mr. Buti Manawela. Regarding the challenge of fee-free higher education, in your view, how will the rollout of South Africa change the composition and the quality of future labor force? Thank you very much, uh, uh, facilitator, and also to the organizers of the conference for having us here and um, for also giving us an, an opportunity to engage with uh, the uh, delegates. I think. The, the fee-free higher education policy in South Africa is quite historic uh, and uh, obviously unprecedented. In many instances, we see this as uh, part of uh, an old struggle that was led by different uh, generations of the student movement, which culminated into uh, government uh, last year agreeing to provide fee-free higher education. There's obviously been challenge in the first year of the rollout. Um, firstly, that uh, you know, uh, to announce that close to 90% of South African household will now qualify to access fee-free higher education is in, is in itself um, uh, you know, revolutionary. Uh, secondly, to open up opportunities for young people who ordinarily would not have had those opportunities. 
in the entire higher education and training sector, which is universities, University of Technology, and also technical vocational education and training institutions, is uh, also quite significant. The third thing is that um, you will then see the demographics of our institutions of higher learning significantly changing precisely because those who, as a result of historical factors, were excluded from the university uh, and from the TVET sector will now have access to those institutions. And I think fourthly, which is I think very, very crucial, is the fact that these opportunities mm -hmm. will mean that uh, you know, you're dealing with questions around the supply side of skills into the labor market. Um, you are obviously uh, talking about uh, you know, meeting some of the demands uh, of the of the of the labor market i mean you know the the our president convened the job summit um, in in october and in november early november convened the investment summit uh, where uh, you know big multinational companies uh, national companies were convened under one roof and one of the crucial issue that was raised in both the job summit and the investment uh, uh, summit was the shortage of skills in the south african labor force um, you know and and we think that through the fee free higher education opening up the doors of um, higher education and training institutions would mean that uh, you know, we are ad addressing the issue around the uh, supply side uh, in terms of the, of the labor market. But what is also crucial about uh, you know, the fee-free education policy is not only about student access, but it's also about improving the quality of uh, our higher education. I mean, South Africa spends uh, you know, comparatively higher in uh, GDP percentage uh, compared to other uh, countries. Of course, we're not yet where we really want to be, uh, but we think that we're investing a lot of money into our uh, education uh, institutions, but the results have been, um, you know, not necessarily satisfactorily. So, so part of what this policy uh, intends to do is firstly to invest into the infrastructure of our education system, secondly invest into the quality of uh, uh, training, uh, you know, meaning that you will have to train our university staff, uh, academic staff, our TVET college lecturers, uh, trainers, facilitators, and all of that. So we think that uh, you know, beyond student access, it's also about improving the face and quality of our uh, you know, education and training system. One of the things that we've seen um, that is being intensified is the collaboration between our education and training institutions and industry, uh, uh, you know, and, and with specific focus on uh, innovation. And we think that you know, the fee-free higher education and, uh, uh, policy presents an opportunity for government to begin to direct students whom they are funding to specific training program which will respond to government's priorities and the country's priorities and needs on the fourth industrial revolution. So this is quite a, you know, a massive program. It involves uh, around 480,000 students. We anticipate that the number will increase in the coming year. Already now, we have received uh, you know, more than 1.5 million inquiries from students who want to benefit from uh, uh, you know, this policy. Um, you know, and, 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 and we think that uh, you know, it's completely going to change the face, not only of South Africa, but of Southern Africa in terms of the uh, skill supply side. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. My next question is to Your Excellency, Professor Dr. Lida Florenda from Mozambique. Since 2016, your ministry announced a strategy to raise $500 million to build, rehabilitate, and expand and equip 39 institutions of technical and professional education in Mozambique. Two years on, 
Are you able to give a progress report on both successes and challenges? Thank you. Muito obrigada, um, senhor moderador. Mas, sendo esta a primeira intervenção que tenho neste fórum, gostaria de começar por agradecer e saudar o governo do Zimbábue, os organizadores do evento e todas as entidades aqui presentes por organização desta semeira que nos coloca a discutir e a partilhar um, assuntos que são relevantes e importantes para o desenvolvimento da, do, do nosso país. Um, de fato, sim. Um, nós tínhamos não necessariamente uma estratégia, mas um pacote de, de iniciativas e ações que visavam a angariação de um certo valor para o apetrechamento da construção e apetrechamento de instituições do ensino técnico profissional. Hum, de fato, hum, desta, desse plano da, das 39 instituições, hum, já con conseguimos construir... Hum, ou melhor, esta estratégia visava a mobilização de fundos. E, um, e esses fundos eram de diversas fontes. A primeira linha era o aumento do investimento através do orçamento de Estado, por se ter definido o ensino técnico profissional como prioridade. A segunda linha eram os fundos externos, através do linhas de crédito ou doações que o país contrata. E a terceira linha, que é, que é a parte inovadora, foi com a criação de um fundo, que é o Fundeca, que é o Fundo de Desenvolvimento de Educação Técnica Profissional, ou Educação Profissional. Neste fundo, tem como, hum, digamos, hum, hum, colaboradores o governo de Moçambique, tem as famílias e pessoas de boa fé na sociedade, mas mais fundamentalmente tem a colaboração das empresas que contribuem para este fundo com 1% mínimo, com 1% sobre a ficha de salários, a folha de salários. Um, o nosso balanço, de fato, é positivo, porque das 39 instituições que nós prevíamos até o momento já foram construídas e ou reabilitadas 29, 28, aliás, e hum, esperamos até 2000, finais de 2019 reabilitar, construir e equipar umas outras 13, totalizando o nosso plano que era, que era 43. Porém, persistem desafios. Ah, o país é vasto, temos um grande número da, da população jovem para treinar, formar para o um emprego. E a grande questão que se pode colocar é que nestas instituições, onde nós estamos a dizer que e, um, conseguimos a sua reabilitação, a sua construção e equipamento, são aquelas instituições que no âmbito da reforma de educação técnico-profissional, nós estamos a implementar o sistema, o modelo de ensino baseado em padrões de competência, estamos a dar só o nível médio do ensino técnico da educação profissional e temos um sistema de registro e certificação um, tutelado por uma entidade reguladora que se criou, que é a ANEP, e por fim temos também se a memória não, não falha, temos também todo um processo de envolvimento da indústria no desenho das qualificações e também na participação do desenvolvimento de novas, bem como da avaliação do, da resposta da indústria 
aos, as potencialidades que a formação forma, cria para estes graduados. E muito obrigada. Thank you, Your Excellency. 28 institutions out of 39, that's a, a very good achievement in two years. So, thank you, thank you very much. I pass uh, my next question to Your Excellency, Professor Amon Morwera. We heard today a lot about Education 5.0. So, can you please summarize Education 5.0 in Zimbabwe? how you plan to promote innovation in universities and the on-campus establishment of innovation hubs. Thank you very much. This Education 5.0 is the reconfiguration of higher education that I was talking about. Um, it's pointed towards a higher education that at the end of the day has its products and services defined instead of just a product which is a piece of paper, which is a certificate, as well as uh, a cap and a gown. I want to make it very clear that our higher education's output system must be seen in the service industry, must be seen in the production industry of physical products. Right. So in order to do this, we said, okay, the best way is to reconfigure the education so that people are told exactly what their product should be. So the product is goods and services. And the process is the configuration 5.0. One, as I was saying, teaching. After teaching, then research. And research, community engagement. This is normally if you go to universities and how most of us professors were promoted. We're promoted on these three. But we say, no, for education to have a meaning to Africa, to have a meaning to us in Zimbabwe, it must lead into products. Therefore, we need a fourth mission, which is called innovation. In this, this is where we have started the program of building innovation hubs. It forces the university to take innovation as one of their key missions. And we have outlined it into our doctrine of higher and tertiary education and how it has to contribute to modernization and industrialization. In the innovation hub process, we are having, as I was saying, three processes. The technical process of seeing the technical goodness or feasibility of any product with the scientists and academics. Number two is the legal product, protection of that, pro, the, that uh, innovated product. Number three is the market feasibility. So these are the three things. But in order for them to happen, we have to have the structures, both mental and physical. The mental structure is over, it's done. But the physical structure is what we are doing right now. We have invested over 15 million uh, US dollars to construct six innovation hubs at six state universities. Starting from December and so far, we have completely completed one. And we are 70% in completing all of them. In actual fact, I was saying it's a record of a government building being finished in one year. It has never happened before. So we are finishing them by 31 December, at least five of them. So this is uh, the issue of the innovation hubs. And our universities have actually embraced it. They were waiting for it. We were not giving them the leeway. We were not giving them the structure to enable them to do that. Because normally, you know, in government circles and in country circles, when universities would try to do innovation, somebody would say, no, that's our mandate. But we say, no, now is the university's mandate and the mandate of everybody working with the universities. So this is what we have done. And we have also done the issue of saying, after the innovation hub and you have got a prototype, so what? If you have a prototype, it normally, it naturally has to be manufactured. So we have started the program of industrial parks. We have uh, been given cabinet uh, approval to establish industrial parks that are linked to the universities and technical colleges. And so far we are going to start, we have already finished planning, and we are going to start with 10 industrial parks in 10 provinces that are linked to the higher and tertiary education institution so that their prototypes can be manufactured. You know, in the industrial park, there's no more need for um, original thinking. This is where we create employment using the higher and tertiary education sector. 
whereby people do routine things. And these are things, we are going to start the building of these industrial parks next year, and I'm sure we are going to do it, we already have the budget to do it, so that we complete our idea of Education 5.0. But in order for this Education 5.0 to be realized, there are things that need to be fixed. The first thing is the programs that we are offering at the universities. Are the programs good? We want to make them very good. We used to have, we have about 24 universities and each of them had a different system. So for example, if you would do crop science at University A and crop science at University B, these crop science degrees did not have the same courses. So what we have done is we have fixed it by doing what we call the Zimbabwe National Qualifications Framework, which makes sure that for every degree that is offered and that is similar across the board, it must have a minimum board of knowledge. And this minimum board of knowledge must be replicated across all. About 70 to 80 percent overlap, and 20 percent to 30 percent would reflect the uniqueness of that institution. But at least when a person graduates with a civil engineering degree, we know what a civil engineering degree is about. So we have done that, and we have concretized it into structural instruments, 132, 133, and 137 of 2018, on 20 July this year to make sure that we bring predictability and trust within our higher edu tertiary education system. And the other one is to make sure that our professors, lecturers are promoted using the same criteria. All our 24 universities were promoting their people in 24 different ways. How would you trust that education system? Although we have a very good education system, but it does not have systems that backs it up. Um, then we have done the promotions infrastructure, which is all professors in this country will be promoted using the same criteria, and we made sure all ordinances of promotion were unified on 27 July this year to support Education 5.0. The other one is physical infrastructure. The physical infrastructure is to be tip-top, is to show that there are student spaces that are inspiring, so we have involved the private sector to make sure on a build operating transfer. For the first time we are saying, higher and tertiary education institutions shall be built sometimes on equity, shall be built using the private sector. We are leading a private sector-led economy. The basic question is, does the government have to own the building at the university? It's a basic question. We said, why were we thinking that the government should own a building at the university? What is the purpose of government? The purpose of government is to make sure that its people are educated with the best facilities. And a building which is in Zimbabwe, does it have to be a state-owned building? If it's in Zimbabwe, it's in Zimbabwe. That's how we have said we are involving the private sector in making sure that they have built student accommodation, and we believe that it's a market that is greater than $100 billion. Why? We have seen that we have got about 180,000 students in our higher and tertiary education system. And you know what? Only 15,000 in accommodation. 165,000, we can't account where they are coming from when they are in the lecture room. So while it seems like a problem, it's a big business opportunity. So we have said, OK, let's open up this big business opportunity. So you see, in order to implement Education 5.0, we needed to fix the program infrastructure. We needed to fix the promotions infrastructure. We needed to fix the physical infrastructure so that Zimbabwe's education becomes an exportable system, which is Education 5.0, with these three baking pillars of good programs, good promotions, as well as good physical infrastructure. This is how far we have gone in basically trying to promote Education 5.0 in opening up the higher and tertiary education sector to business. We believe it's a business that is worth 100 billion. For the first time we are saying, as government, we, are, we want to operate universities on equity. It has never been heard of. During the colonial era, during the first republic, it was not heard of. It's only heard of in the second republic. This is how we believe we can take higher and tertiary education forward by opening it up for business so that it delivers education 5.0, that is heritage-based, where we study things that matter. That matter to us, they will matter to Africa, they will matter to the world. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Your Excellency. As a millennial, I'm so much impressed, and I would love like, to, to say thank you on behalf of all the millennials of Africa, because this is what we need for innovation. We need this type of initiatives, and I believe this uh, Education 5.0 could be even patented and applied to other African countries. Thank you, thank you again. <clears throat> My next question is uh, to uh, Mr. Uh, Rivu from Madagascar. <clears throat> is the government of Madagascar intervening in the higher education sector by investing in programs for developing entrepreneurs and technology apprenticeship? Oui, euh, effectivement, donc, euh, le gouvernement euh, de Madagascar, disons, euh, agit toujours au nom du ministère de l'enseignement supérieur et de la recherche scientifique dans le cadre de, de ce qui se touche, touche de la formation dans l'enseignement supérieur et tout ce qui est recherche scientifique. Euh, dans ce cadre-là, développer des dispositifs et stratégies de formation innovante dans les universités, ça permet en fait euh, de mieux euh, répondre euh, les besoins des, euh, des, des secteurs privés. C'est-à-dire que euh, ben, l'entrepreneuriat, pas des entrepreneurs, donc euh, euh, s'intègre euh, un peu plus dans la formation, surtout à la fin des cycles, pour permettre donc de, de mettre en cohérence les parties, disons, euh, euh, parties théoriques et pratiques euh, euh, apprises lors des premières années, par exemple, les deux premières années, pour, par exemple, pour le grade de licence. Et en troisième année, donc, le privé, donc, les, on intervient pour mettre des matières transversales, comme l'entrepreneuriat, pour permettre, donc, à ces étudiants d'avoir euh, déjà un esprit entrepreneurial, soit pour créer des entreprises par la suite, soit avoir à mieux à gérer leur carrière quand ils vont travailler. Euh, de même pour le cycle du Grand Master. Euh, ici, par exemple, donc, pour nous, donc, à l'école normale supérieure, euh, on crée donc, des laboratoires scientifiques, des laboratoires de langue, des bibliothèques euh, et des médiathèques numérisées pour permettre et mettre aussi des, euh, des équipements informatiques pour mettre, qui permet donc aux étudiants d'avoir un accès généralisé, mais aussi pour, euh, développer un espace qui permet aux, aux entreprises privées de s'intégrer vraiment dans, le, dans, dans le, les, les institutions d'enseignement supérieur qui ont des collaborations avec eux. Euh, avec le projet industriel aussi, des industries aussi, il y a euh, des concours d'innovation qu'on effectue avec les secteurs privés et le ministre, ministère de l'Industrie et du Développement du secteur privé et aussi avec le ministère d'Enseignement supérieur et de Recherche scientifique. Donc avec ces projets-là, ça permet donc de développer des entrepreneurs ruraux par exemple dans ce cadre d'un projet qui permet de, de former euh, des jeunes euh, qui, qui ont le niveau euh, universitaire mais qui veulent vraiment euh, travailler dans le monde rural, c'est-à-dire qu'ils vont exploiter une grande euh, euh, bah, une, une grande euh, parcelle pour cultiver avec toutes les machines nécessaires pour cultiver. On les apprend aussi à à conditionner les produits et aussi à faire le marketing pour permettre donc de, euh, de vendre euh, ces, euh, ces, euh, ces récoltes et aussi faire des transformations pour permettre d'avoir euh, un peu plus de valeur ajoutée sur ces produits agricoles. Et ça, donc, ça, c'est appuyé donc euh, ce projet, c'est un projet qui est appuyé par la Banque africaine de développement pour permettre vraiment d'exploiter au maximum, disons, les euh, terrains qui sont cultivables, qui sont, qui sont euh, des terrains qui sont productifs, mais aussi ça permet donc de, euh, de répondre aux besoins locaux, mais aussi aux besoins régionaux. Euh, 
euh, une des politiques de Madagascar, donc, dans le ministère de l'Agriculture, c'est de, euh, disons, de, de faire que euh, Madagascar soit, d'ici 5-10 ans, d'avoir un, un grenier de, de l'océan Indien pour permettre, donc, de produire plus et que les surplus vont être euh, exportés pour permettre, donc, de d'avoir un commerce de, des produits agricoles euh, dans la région de l'océan Indien. Il y a aussi donc le programme au niveau du ministère de l'enseignement supérieur sur la mise en place des plateformes au niveau des universités euh, qui s'appelle Paul Stage and Job, euh, c'est-à-dire c'est une plateforme auquel euh, les privés, les entreprises viennent à l'intérieur euh, du euh, de, de ce plateforme, c'est un endroit où ils peuvent faire des conférences, des exposés sur les métiers où ils travaillent et en même temps les jeunes qui viennent ou qui sont en fin de cycle ou qui, qui, sont, qui ont déjà obtenu leur diplôme permettra de voir euh, une rencontre entre l'employeur et les futurs euh, jeunes qui vont être employés dans, euh, dans, les, dans les entreprises. Et ça aussi, ça a permis donc de, de renforcer euh, la capacité des étudiants euh, par des formations, disons, euh, spontanées sur l'entrepreneuriat, sur, euh, sur lequel euh, les entreprises vont faire, euh, disons, ces conférences ou euh, euh, des, des forums ou des ateliers qui permettent donc de, 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 de donner aux étudiants une aperçu de la vie dans l'entreprise, mais également c'est une plateforme qui permet de, euh, de faire euh, un recrutement et de mettre aussi les offres d'emploi dans ce cadre-là. Voilà, merci, monsieur le modérateur. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think we are running out of time. This discussion could run for hours. We love to hear about entrepreneurship, about a new education system. This is what we need in Africa. We need things that create jobs. We need things that promote innovation in our countries. And this is what we aim for the future, with your help. So thank you. Thank you, Your Excellencies, for the time that you uh, get with us to answer our questions. I would love to say something about Canon before we move, okay? So Canon as a company is a technology company, but Canon is more interested in people than in technology. As much as we empower technology, but we empower people more. This is what we decided, Canon decided to establish something called Canon Central and North Africa. It's an entity specifically designed for Africa. We have eight trip offices all around Africa, and we are growing year over year because it's not technology that change countries, it's people who change the countries. Thank you, everyone. I will run a small video about Canon, and thank you again. Thank you.